It is warm and breezy. Another perfect day in paradise. Surfers Paradise Australia, site of round two of the 1997 PPG Cart World Series. Welcome to Cart Indy Carnival Australia. The field of 28 is on the track, warming tires and engines in anticipation of the green flag now just moments away. Hi, everybody. I'm Bob Varsha. How strongly do the Australians feel about their Indy Carnival? Well, consider that the race today dominates not only the front page of the newspaper, but the back page as well. And that enthusiasm is reflected in the performance of the drivers. For proof, look no further than the final moments of final qualifying. Alex Zanardi found himself in second place to Paul Tracy. So he cinched up his bravery belt, went out, and with this kind of driving, bouncing his car off of the curbs but avoiding the walls, he nipped two tenths of a second off of Tracy's best time, and Zanardi picked up his sixth consecutive pole. That's a record, deleting Mario Andretti and Danny Sullivan from the record books. Now, speaking of Danny Sullivan, he's not feeling well. He won't be with us today, so stepping in, veteran IndyCar commentator Jan Bikas. Jan, that was spectacular driving. It was, but you know, as wild as Zanardi's run was, the key to winning this race may be the driver that is not spectacular, and that's because both Firestone and Goodyear brought the softest tires ever here to Australia. That makes the cars faster, but if you run it too hard after three or four laps, no more grip left in those tires. A couple keys, it's very hot here today. It'll be an even bigger problem. Secondarily, come off the slow corners. There are many of them here. Squeeze the throttle pedal. If you spin the rear wheels, you'll burn the tires right off the car. All right, thank you, Jan. Here's a look at our lineup for today's race. On pole, Alex Zanardi next to Paul Tracy, one of three former Surfers Paradise winners in the field. Row two, Jimmy Vassar. Victor here a year ago. Greg Moore will be alongside. He joined Vassar on the podium in third a year ago. On row three, Mark Blundell in his first visit to Surfers alongside Parker Johnstone. On row four, Scott Pruitt. 1.2 seconds quicker than the field in the morning warm-up. He'll be next to Mauricio Gugelman. On row five, Chris Christian Fittipaldi and Bobby Rahal. On row six, Gilles DeFerrin, who led strongly at Miami. He'll be next to Michael Andretti, who won in Miami. He is the third of our former winners in today's race. No driver has won this race twice. On row seven will be Dario Franchitti, the top qualified rookie in the field, next to Andre Ribeiro. On row eight, Adrian Fernandez and Brian Herta. Row nine, Al Unser Jr., who's had all kinds of problems here. Slowest in the morning warm-up. He'll be next to Brazilian rookie Walter Salas. Row 10, Raul Bozell and Richie Hearn. On row 11, Patrick Carpentier, who leads the rookie points. He'll be next to Max Pappas. On row 12, Juan Fangio II. And Paul Jasper making his series debut here in Surfers. On row 13, P.J. Jones and Michelle Jardin Jr. And on our 14th and final row, German Arn Meyer making his series debut as well, alongside Japanese driver, Hero Matsushita. Here's a look at our race analysis. The course, 2.795 miles around, slightly longer than in previous years due to a change to one of the chicanes. The race length, 65 laps scheduled. The race record set by Jimmy Vassar here last year. And the pit window, 20 to 24 laps. But if the tire story should play out as we think it might, those pit stops may come a lot sooner. Jan, let's talk in further detail now about the racetrack. Well, Bob, especially in this section of the racetrack, you can see it's very, very slow. But right after this, there's a 170. 70 mile an hour straightaway. This this track is actually traditionally very tough on gearboxes and on brakes. They'll be hauling down the straightaway here and then taking it all the way down to 60 miles an hour in the S's upcoming. Here are the stories we'll be following as the day unfolds. If Michael Andretti is to stay undefeated in 1997, he'll have to do it from the middle of the pack once again, the 12th starting spot. Tire management, as we mentioned, is going to be important. The course is very hard on brakes and gearboxes, transmissions and the like. And the key to winning this race down through the six previous runnings has been avoiding trouble. That means staying off the walls and out of the way of other cars. You ride with Christian Fittipaldi. Bob, one of the things that we want to watch very carefully is that first turn. We have a chicane right after the start-finish line. Paul Tracy is known to be an extremely aggressive starter, but of course, Alex Zanardi on pole is not going to make it easy for him. Our coverage coming courtesy of Channel 10 Australia. We're glad to be working with them here at Surfers Paradise. There is the front of the field as they work their way around. Alex Zanardi with an astonishing run of poles going back to last year, six races in a row, and on three of those occasions, it came on his very last lap of qualifying. One thing to keep in mind, however, he had to run four or five fast laps to get that speed. Paul Tracy, who was also on the front row, he did his time with running those tires only one hard lap. So Paul Tracy thinks he'll have better tires at the beginning of the race. We'll also be watching Al Unser Jr., who has had nothing but problems while his teammate, Paul Tracy, as you see, starts on the front row. 
Next to Alex Zanardi. Final corner on to the Gold Coast Highway. Comes the field as we get set for the green flag. Bunched very tightly. Zanardi keeping the pace very slow at this point. There he goes. He's hit the button. The green flag waves. We're underway. Tight chicane coming up. Some pushing and shoving in the chicane, but it appears everyone got through cleanly. This is the second chicane. And now a tight left-hander coming up as Zanardi leads Tracy. There's Jimmy Vassar, followed by Greg Moore, Parker Johnstone, and Scott Pruitt. Scott Pruitt is looking very racy. He was a second and a half quicker than anybody in this morning's warm-up. So he is trying to benefit from that and work his way through the field. He is in the bright yellow and orange car, making a move it looked like on Parker Johnstone. Andre Ribeiro getting out of line. And there's Pruitt trying to get around Johnstone. Oh, oh Johnstone Parker got loose. Oh, my. Parker Johnstone coming into those S's there. Got the thing all kinds of sideways and thankfully no contact. Watch the cars go through here. Some guys will use the curves and some won't. Parker Johnstone seems to be in trouble. Looks like he's slowing. You can see the big gap back from Greg Moore. Pruitt is by. The rest of the field surges around the green and white machine. There is Johnstone making the left-hander. His team owner is Barry Green, Australian born and bred. This is a very important home race for Parker Johnstone's team. These are the kind of corners right here that we talked about at the opening of the show. That's where you have to really squeeze the throttle pedal to make sure you do not get wheel spin. Alex Zanardi was very aggressive on that first lap. Now let's see if Paul Tracy can close in. Let's get down to Gary Gerald in the pit lane with more on Scott Pruitt's situation. Well, we understand, according to radio conversations, that there was contact between Parker Johnstone and Scott Pruitt. The crew is ready for Parker to bring the car in. They're still looking for him. He may have gone by with the pack on the front straightaway. We couldn't tell, Bob. No, Parker no, Johnstone did now. make the pit in. Yes, he is. And a heavy crash back up course. That's Gilles DeFerrin in the foreground. Michelle Jourdain's car backwards with the Mex Lube on the rear wing looking towards us. And there is a red wing Budweiser, so Christian Fittipaldi was involved in that as well. Looks like Jourdain able to move his car. I can't tell if he lost the fire or not. Debris wow. all over the racetrack. Full course caution flags have come out. DeFerrin's car on the left. Now here's another look. Oh my. That is Christian impact. Fittipaldi's car just exploding into pieces. And here he comes with nothing left on the car. Oh, my. That, that was a oh, that was a big, big crash coming into the first chicane. DeFerrin touches the wall on the left as Michael Andretti works his way through the debris, followed by Andre Ribeiro with the bright lime green nose. There is Christian Fittipaldi. It looks like he's all right. Somehow he must have touched wheels with another car and it just turned him straight into the wall. Fittipaldi remains in the car. Okay, there's no one in front of him. He's coming by our commentary position. This is a start finish line coming down to the first chicane. Oh, he must have got touched. Oh, yowch. He must have been touched from behind because he was, he was on the straightaway and someone touched him. And he is in pain. You think about legs and feet at this point. The front end of the car missing completely. Oh. And we have a red flag. They will stop the race. Well, we'll follow this story and return in a moment. A beautiful day here in Surfer's Paradise, but the red flag is out, and there is concern on the racetrack. Stay with us. ABC Sports coverage of the Indy Carnival Australia. Brought to you by the Ford F-150. Strength after strength after strength. Miller Lite, who reminds you that anything can happen at Miller time. Valvoline Durablend, the number one selling semi-synthetic motor oil. And Goodyear, number one in tires. 
Welcome back to Surfers Paradise Australia and the Kart IndyCar Australia. Bob Varsha along with Jan Bikas. We are under a red flag. The race has been brought to a stop as the result of an enormous accident involving Gilles de Ferran and Christian Fittipaldi. Now let's review what happened, Jan. Well, it's on the front straightaway. The contact has already happened between the two cars and then very heavy contact for Christian Fittipaldi right at the pit exit. But now remember, his car has no brakes. No way to stop this thing. He comes down, flies over the curb, and he really is just along for the ride. Nothing a driver can do at this point. As you can see, heavy damage to the front end of the car. Now we'll take another look at that same shot in real time so you get a better idea of the impact. Look at the debris that the other cars are having to thread through. Now remember, when a car really just explodes like that, that is what you want. The designers want the car to dissipate the energy, but this is an incredibly heavy hit. If we go back to look to see how it happened from Michael Andretti, you can see ahead, there is Gilles DeFerrin. He's trying to move to the left to pass Christian Fittipaldi. Christian moves to the left to keep him behind. They make contact and then, wow, straight into the wall. And look at the debris. Down to Gary Gerald, standing by with Jill DeFerrin. Well, here is Gilles DeFerrin. Jill, tell us what happened. Well, I was uh, beside uh, Christian here going down the street, and maybe he didn't see me, but, but I ended up touching him and the wall at the same time. And, uh, you know, it was a pretty big accident. I just hope uh, he's okay. And from your own standpoint now, your crew is scrambling. They're going to restart this race, and you'll go to the backup car? Yeah, thank God I feel okay, so uh, we should be able to restart the race. Have you had laps in that backup car this weekend? Yes, uh, we ran a little bit on Friday, and they seem be fine. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Gary. Now let's go to Jack Aroot with Michael Andretti. Well, we're talking to Michael Andretti, who just came out of his car, and you caught all the shrapnel from your teammate. It got wild out there, Michael. Yeah, it was really scary. It was really scary for uh, Christian. You know, it looked really bad. Hopefully, he'll be okay. Now, I've got some of your antennas. You've replaced them, but you were just saying just moments ago you thought it was going to be a bad break for Paul Tracy, but now you found out it's a complete restart, so it becomes a moot point. Well, we'll see if it's a complete restart. Start. We're still going to protest that because I don't believe that it should be. One of the things Michael's upset about, guys, is the fact that he felt that a complete lap had been completed. But as he said, he's going to have to think about it and let the team make the decision. All right, thanks, Jack. Now, that wasn't the only accident going on. Ahead of the major conflict, Paul Tracy suffered some damage to his Penske Mercedes. Here's Gary Gerald with Tracy in the pits. Paul Tracy back here in the pitch. Can you tell us what happened? You were ahead of the major crash. Well, I, uh, just uh, my fault. I just uh, touched a tire, and the tires are so thick here. It sucked me into it and ripped the front corner off. And uh, luckily, luckily, I was able to get around with the Marlboro car, and uh, we're going we're gonna to restart the race and run my primary car, which was the car we intended to run all race weekend long, but we blew an engine on Friday morning and went to the spare car and just stayed in it. So we're, uh, we're comfortable with that decision. We're, uh, Cart let us run the, the our primary car, which was our backup car now, and, and uh, I feel pretty good about it. Will you have to be more conservative for the start of this, uh, or the restart now that you climb into the other car? No, I don't, the car's set up the exact same. Uh, everything's ready to go on it. Uh, you know, it's a new race, so here we go. Thank you. Well, it appears we will have a restart. The question at this point is what kind of restart we will have and who will be allowed to take part Let's go down to Jack Aroot, standing by with card official Ron Richards. The vice president of communications and also the spokesperson, Ron, sort this out for us. What's the rule that's being called into play? Well, there's a rule that allows us, Jack, to restart the race from the very beginning if the leader hasn't completed two laps. That's the situation we have here at this point. Two of the teams will be able to bring out cars and restart from the very get-go. Now, who are those two teams? And we know about Tracy. Who's the second one? Uh, DeFerrin. So this is all provided for in the rule book, so regardless of what we've heard, there's no protest. It's unprotestable. That's right. Thank you, Ron. Bob? All right, thank you, Jack. That clears that up. Christian Fittipaldi was cut from the car and placed in an ambulance. We do not have an update on him right now, although he appeared to be conscious and alert. We'll be back with more from Surfer's Paradise in just a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back to Australia. We are ready for a full restart of today's card, Indy Carnival Australia, after a massive accident involving Gilles DeFerrin and Christian Fittipaldi. The entire field is back on the racetrack, preparing for the restart, with the exception of Phil Fittipaldi's car. Let's get more on his condition now. Jack Aroot. Straight 20. 
This is Steve Olby, who's the current medical director. Steve, can you give us the official update on Christian? Christian has a broken right lower leg, uh, will require surgery later. He has no other injuries, uh, otherwise he's doing very well, but he does have a broken leg. And guys, right now he's going to be transferred to a nearby hospital. Well, after the violence of that accident, I guess that is some good news. Only a broken leg for Christian Fittipaldi. It is. That was a very heavy impact. But think about what the drivers are going through now. They have to try and build all that adrenaline back up again. You really plan your whole day to get ready for that initial race start. Now they have to try and recoup all that and try and get their senses back. As we saw a few moments ago, Gilles DeFerrin very much shaken by that accident, as was Michael Andretti. But now it's time to get back to business. Alex Zanardi, with his record-breaking sixth consecutive pole, leads Paul Tracy, who had an accident of his own and is driving his backup car. There's also a story involving Al Unser Jr., who cut three tires on the debris from the accident and had three tires replaced. He will start back in the field. Full restart, except for Christian Fittipaldi. We are ready for the green flag once again as they come down. Zanardi once again, very slow. Now he hits the button. We have green. Tracy and Zanardi were really jockeying for position there. Greg Moore slots into third. Jimmy Vassar drops back. Parker Johnstone under acceleration, getting squirrely. The fifth car in line in green and white. The biggest benefactors, like you said, Bob, looks like Greg Moore really took advantage of that. What was happening there was Zanardi and Tracy were really just playing cat and mouse, waiting, and what happened there was Tracy got ahead and had to back off the throttle. Zanardi already locking up the brakes on the back side of the course. And once again, Scott Pruitt moving up quickly. He went around Mark Lundell as they stream on to the Oceanside Boulevard here, the Esplanade at Surfer's Paradise. Now into the third of four chicanes. All clean for Parker Johnstone that time. That, of course, is where he did have contact with Scott Pruitt on our first start. 160 to 165 miles an hour. And then this very quick chicane. This is the one that was modified slightly, moving the wall back to give the drivers a little more room and better sight lines as they come out. Here comes Gugelman. He did. He got Parker Johnstone. And it looks like Scott Pruitt may get him as well. Let's see as they enter the S's. Tightest part of the racetrack. There is Mo Gugelman, then Scott Pruitt, then Parker Johnstone, who lost two places in that shuffle. Flashing onto the Gold Coast Highway, Jack Aroot has more on Scott Pruitt. Well, guys, that red flag condition was a benefit to Scott Pruitt. What he did was made some major chassis changes. The idea being that after that first lap, he didn't like what he had. It seems to have paid off for him thus far. There is Alex Zanardi. Rookie of the year last year, Paul Tracy runs second, Greg Moore third, Jimmy Vassar fourth, followed by Mo Gugelman, Scott Pruitt, Parker Johnstone, Mark Lundell, Bobby Rahal, and Michael Andretti round out the top ten. They're pretty evenly spaced right now. We have a great difference of equipment and engines and tires here in this group. So the parity so far looks as though it's excellent here in the kart series. One of the stories we wanted to follow was Michael Andretti. Could he charge through the field the way he did in the season opener at Miami? And it appears he is. He's already made up a couple of positions on the first lap. Coming down the back straightaway, 170 miles an hour. He's behind Ray Hall right now. The black car seems to close a little bit there on Ray Hall. Michael Andretti trying to get his momentum going. Obviously, he was probably as shaken as anyone because he was right in the middle of that initial incident. He went down an extra gear there. He could see the traffic ahead of him starting to pile up, so he went down one more gear than he normally would. That's normally a third gear chicane. He went down to second gear. Hard left-hander. This is where Paul Tracy and Michael Andretti came together last year, an incident that sparked an outcry among the drivers and earned Michael Andretti a reprimand and probation for aggressive driving. He went on to win five races last year, more than any other driver in the series, and took the championship to the final race of the year before Jimmy Vassar emerged with his first title. Once again, on to the Gold Coast Highway in front of grandstands packed with fans for this Indy Carnival. There is Alex Zanardi with Paul Tracy just behind, and they begin to draw away from the third-place car of Greg Moore. 
Paul Tracy is staying with Alex Zanardi very well. There was a lot of questions about the Penske chassis because Paul Tracy put together one real flyer lap, but we did not know if he could do that consistently. It does appear as though he can. Paul Tracy in the Penske Mercedes running on Goodyear tires. There's Mauricio Gugelman with Scott Pruitt just behind. Both these two cars are really picking up the pace here. They are the two cars that we may want to keep an eye on as far as moving through the field, as far as being aggressive right off that start. Scott Pruitt keeping right behind the Hollywood car there of Goose. Oh, he, he got a good run on him coming into chicane here. Gugelman is fifth. Pruitt is sixth. Gugelman, the Brazilian with Formula One experience. Scott Pruitt, the karting star from California, worked his way through the sedan ranks on his way to kart racing. Here's a look at our standings. Alex Zanardi over Paul Tracy, Greg Moore, Jimmy Vassar, and Mauricio Gugelmeen. Scott Pruitt sixth. We'll be back. Part of the weekend for drivers here in Australia involves going out and having a good time, including visiting with a white tiger and perhaps feeding the little cub. For Scott Pruitt, it was an opportunity to ride with the light cavalry. Right. Max Amazing guys. We'll be back. You can't believe. For more Indy Carnival Australia after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Tonight, ABC starts with an hour where your family stars in America's Funniest Home Videos. Then a special Sunday night edition of Primetime Live and the world television premiere of When Secrets Kill, based on the best-selling book starring Gregory Harrison. All that tonight on ABC. You ride with reigning PPG Kart World Series champion Jimmy Vassar, defending champion on the streets of Surfer's Paradise, Australia. Vassar runs in fourth place, chasing Greg Moore. Now, Jimmy Vassar is one of these guys that is a left foot breaker. His teammate, Alex Zanardi, uses his right foot on the brake pedal. So as he comes down this straightaway, you can actually listen to him get on the brakes really late. And he actually had a little bit of trouble downshifting there. Wasn't able to blip the car as much as he would like. But he is a guy that requires a little different setup on the car because he uses the left foot on the brake and actually carries the brake a little bit into the corner. Dropping back now, Mauricio Gugelman still in a battle with Scott Pruitt. These guys have been nose to tail, lap after lap, battling over fifth place. Scott Pruitt is much more comfortable in this car than he was yesterday. This is Raul Boisel's spare car, which is originally numbered 40X. They've changed the number to 20. However, the chassis remains the same. It has a different seat, pedals, and some other things inside the cockpit that, of course, are different for Raul than for Scott. Much more comfortable, and obviously, he's going quickly right now. Both cars, Reynards, both of them on Firestone tires. Scott Pruitt has a Ford Cosworth power, a Mercedes B8 propels Mauricio Gugelman. Now, Scott Pruitt is also a driver that is on the harder compound tire. So you would think that his car will perform better as the race goes on. Paul Tracy, meantime, up front, has closed on Zanardi. Does he have room for a move? Nope, he lights up those Goodyear tires, pulling right up onto Zanardi's gearbox. Now, Zanardi is on the softer Firestone tires, so maybe what we talked about at the beginning of the show is starting to play. He ran those tires very hard in qualifying, and Paul Tracy did not. And Paul Tracy now looks like he's ready to pounce. A great view looking out the back of Zanardi's car. The best place to see if Paul Tracy is going to try and make a move. If you're going to try and pass someone here, you're going to have to go for it. But we have an indication now, full course yellow. We have twin caution flags from the flag stand. Full course caution. They 
Tracy Zanardi. Tracy going very slowly, acknowledging the flags. All of this happening with six laps complete. Now, here is the reason. The car on the right is young Brazilian rookie Walter Salas. And then Brian Herta is trying to take avoiding action here. Right across the chicane. And doesn't touch anything. Man, that was close. As you see, Herta had to take to the sod. That was a case of Walter Salas coming down the main straightaway, getting on the brakes a little bit late, getting out where some of the rubber starts to accumulate. He really wasn't on line. May have actually been trying to let Herta through, and the car got away from him. Now the streaks of rubber show you Salas's progress across the chicane. Now these are actually city streets. That sod on the right, the grass is actually laid on the streets once the curb stones are laid down. A remarkable job engineering this temporary street circuit in Surfer's Paradise. Here's another look at Salas who gets them all locked up. The back end comes around. At this point, Brian Herta is wondering, where can I go? And Brian Herta does a great job of not locking up the brakes. If you were to lock up the brakes, he would have slid right into Solace. But what he did, he kept the wheels rotating. He picked his spot. And thankfully, no contact between the two cars. Well, Bozell and Richie Hearn got through in the background. There you see Solace, who was pushed into life, but now appears to be going slowly again. Now there is Scott Pruitt who has been a darling of the fans here in Surfer's Paradise this weekend. A moment ago, you saw him riding with the light cavalry. Well, they liked the beach so much, he decided to get a view from high overhead. So he climbed into the back of the cockpit of a plane flown by the Royal Australian Air Force Roulettes. And what better way to spend your time with the roulettes than to pull out the camera and take some pictures you won't find anywhere else. We'll be back. Onto the Gold Coast Highway comes Alex Zanardi with Paul Tracy and Greg Moore just behind. This is going to be an interesting restart. And looks like Vassar had a chance to get by Greg Moore there, but then Greg Moore came across in front. Indy Carnival Australia is back under green with nine laps complete of 65 scheduled. Oh, Michael Andretti tried to move through the chicane and it didn't work. Now this will be somewhat of a disadvantage for Paul Tracy because Paul Tracy seemed to be able to close in on Zanardi when Zanardi's tires got hot. So now he's going to try and pressure Zanardi, and he's doing it. You can see the smoke coming off the front brakes. Looking back from Zanardi's car at Paul Tracy, he draws away on the Seaside Highway, the Esplanade. Well, you can't ask for cars to run closer together than this. Just one line from the front to the back. On the left is Richie Hearn. On the right, Michelle Jourdain Jr. We have another collision here at Surfer's Paradise. There's Walter Salas. Watch the left side of your screen. Up by the inside wall is Jourdain, who tried to get under Hearn and spun under braking. That's very similar to what we saw happen to Walter Salas and Brian Herta, but in this case, the cars did make contact. And once again, we have a full course caution. Remember, these are public roads with oil and grease accumulated in the middle of each individual lane, a heavy crown to help rain run off. It is not your average billiard table flat racetrack. Now, Michelle Jourdain was trying to pick up a spot there. He is the youngest driver in the field at 20 years old, and just on cold tires, it got away from him. So we are under yellow once again as you see the field moving through. Alex Zanardi leads Paul Tracy, Greg Moore, Jimmy Vassar, Mauricio Gujamin, and the rest. We'll be back with more from Surfer's Paradise shortly. Back at Surfer's Paradise, we're just moments away from a green flag. During the yellow, several cars pitted, including Al Unzer Jr., and then a problem, Jan. 
and it appeared as though right when he left the pits, that left rear wheel started to wobble. He only made it through three or four corners. And of course, if you don't have both rear wheels on with these type of differentials, he could not drive it back to the pits. And the Farron also pitted. Richie Hearn was in and out. He was involved in the spin with Michel Jourdain Jr. that brought out this yellow flag. We are now ready to go green. It'll be interesting to see how these guys now do as their tires have cooled. It appears as though Paul Tracy's car is better when the tires are hot. Just about what we talked about at the opening of the show. Alex Zanardi's car does appear to start to get a little bit loose because the rear tires seem to give up as it gets hotter. But of course, this keeps being a big break for Zanardi because he gets to cool his tires down. 12 laps in, and we have seen a lot in this race already. Gary Gerald's in the pits with a story. Track temperatures, Bob, on the initial start, 114 degrees. It cooled during the delay under cloud cover to 106. The second restart, it went up to 112. That's where it's at right now. Thank you, Gary. We're back underway to the lower left of your screen. Greg Moore has his hands full with Jimmy Vassar, who tries to get around but can't get it done at the first chicane. That is the second time that Jimmy Vassar has almost been able to dispense of Greg Moore on the restart. Of course, that is Honda versus Mercedes. Greg Moore in the blue and white car with the Mercedes, and of course, Honda with Jimmy Vassar. Both cars are Reynards. Both are on Firestone tires. Greg Moore drove a 96 version of the Reynard in the season opener at Miami. Now he's in 97 equipment. Once again, Zanardi lighting up that right front on the backside as they turn alongside the ocean. Alex Zanardi knows that he has to push very hard when the tires are cold because he now knows that Paul Tracy, when the tires get warm, is going to be challenging him heavily. And Jan Vikas, that's exactly what's happening to Zanardi's car right now. As they begin to build the laps, he radios in and says the car begins to get very loose. What the team is determined to do, now remember, Zanardi started on the primary tire. That's a softer compound in the Firestone brand than the optional tire. Well, Zanardi and the team have decided they're going to take a half turn out of the wing and go to the optional tire on the first pit stop, which we should see sometime around lap 20 to lap 24. Now, they will be able to actually stop a little bit later if they want to. Their pit window will open then, but because we have run so many laps on yellow, they can really conserve fuel. Now, Alex Zanardi has a problem with his handling, so he'll come in at the beginning of the window. Guys like Paul Tracy, if he's happy with his car, will wait till the last part of the window. You see the gap from Zanardi on the right to Paul Tracy. Look back now from Zanardi's car. Bounding across the curbs in the chicane. Alex Zanardi obviously is in radio communication, and when Jack was talking about they'll be changing tires, he now knows, why don't I just go ahead and see what I can get out of these tires, go ahead and throw the car around, see if I can possibly pull away from Paul Tracy, because he knows the second two-thirds of the race, he's going to have tires a bit different, that he can run harder and not have these kind of problems like he's having currently. Alex Zanardi has had a remarkable weekend. He came here and began suffering from conjunctivitis, a problem with some discharge from his eyes that he was treated for successfully, obviously. That qualifying run was absolutely mesmerizing. Not only Zanardi's sixth consecutive pole position, but also his 10th consecutive front row start. Now let's talk about Zanardi's teammate, Jimmy Vassar, a little bit. Here's Jack Aru. Well, Bob, you know, we're talking about Zanardi being able to go out and throw the car around a little bit. A little different strategy going underway with his teammate, Jimmy Vassar. They're going for fuel consumption. What they're doing now is they're running at what's called position number three. The optimum race position for this team would be position number five. So they're in a fuel conservation mode right now. Zanardi, conversely, is running just one click, as we say, down below full optimum fuel. He's running at position five. There's his position six. All right, thank you, Jackie. Now, the reason that they talk about position and they don't say how much they're leaning down the car is because they know that all the other teams listen to their radio communications. So when they say go to position five, position five will be different at every single race. They will actually put a different dial on the knob for every race as kind of like a code between the driver and the engineer. So you have to kind of determine from that if that's leaner or richer. But Jan, sometimes what happens is they forget about that code 
it is the case this morning, and over the radio, the crew chief has to remind the driver. Excuse us, Jack. We had an attempt at best there as Scott Pruitt took a run, got right alongside Mauricio Gujumin, but he couldn't get it done. And just behind Pruitt, the queue is now beginning to close up. Parker Johnstone in the green and white car is just behind Pruitt. Parker Johnstone did seem to somewhat struggle at the beginning of the race, but of course they have burned off fuel, so possibly Parker Johnstone's car is happier now that the car is lighter. Gujumin has fifth place. Scott Pruitt wants it. Don't forget about Michael Andretti. He's in the black car right at the back end of this group. Andretti now shown in the ninth position. At the back of this train of cars, there is Michael Andretti right along. That's Mark Blundell just ahead. It looked like he had a shot there, or he was thinking about making a move coming off that Foster chicane. But he's decided now to kind of hang back just a little bit. You don't want to follow too close. If you go right on the gearbox of the car you're following, you can't build any momentum to go by them. So now he's going to kind of give himself a couple of car lengths, and he's going to try and do this next left-hand corner the best he can. And there you can see a little bit of the slipping. That's what we talked about, the opening of the show. But you know what? Blundell got off that corner better than Andretti. Well, Michael can make some more history. He got that first win for an American chassis in 14 years in Miami. The last time an American-made chassis won outside the continental United States was more than 18 years ago when A.J. Foyt drove a Coyote Foyt to victory at Silverstone in England. Everyone holds their position. But I think that Scott Pruitt and Mauricio Guzman are starting to catch up to Vassar. So they have picked up the pace. Very bumpy in the braking areas for many of these corners. Seems as though the racing gets better if they can continue. And oh, PJ Jones has an engine problem. Jones is out of the card. His race is run. You ride with Andre Ribeiro in 11 spot. We'll return with more Indy Carnival Australia after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Back at Indy Carnival Australia, side by side in the short shoot, headed for the ocean. Paul Tracy goes around race leader Alex Zanardi. Alex Zanardi has been trying to hold off Paul Tracy. He took a little bit too much speed coming off the front straightaway, slipped a little bit wide, and Paul Tracy said thank you very much and inherited the lead. Tracy has watched lap after lap, corner after corner, as Zanardi froze his tires to the pavement and smoke. And that, of course, is what Paul Tracy was trying to do. Paul Tracy is trying to put pressure on Zanardi right here. Zanardi gets a little bit loose over the bumps, and then he cannot get the car stopped or turned in time. See, he's to the right-hand side of the line. That gives Paul Tracy the proper line, and nice traction coming off the corner, and there, it's a drag race. Now, here's a view out the back of Zanardi's car. There's the tire smoke. At that point, Paul Tracy knows he has the window of opportunity he needs. And he drafts by on the left side. So now Paul Tracy back into the lead for the first time in a long time. Now that is where Paul Tracy's maturity came in. A few years ago, he may have pushed the issue harder. Now he knew that Zanardi was having trouble with his tires. And look at the distance he has been able to pull out on Zanardi. That shows you how much Paul Tracy was holding back, waiting for his opportunity. An enormous gap for Tracy now that he has gotten around that man, Alex Zanardi. Now, I'll tell you, the guy that's going to be most frustrated is Al Unser Jr. because he's in the pits watching Paul Tracy out there in a Penske machine right now, looking like he's got the best car on the racetrack. Paul Tracy now firmly ensconced in the lead. Now, moments ago, we saw the left rear tire depart Al Unser Jr.'s car. He's standing by in the pit area with Jackaroo. Well, we have an audio problem with that interview. Needless to say, a tough day for Allenser Jr. And now we have yellow flags from the flag stand, a full course caution. And we expect pit stops this time around. There you see Vassar, Gugelman, and Pruitt running nose to tail. Of course, these guys are really going to be pushing it, trying to get back to the pits. They know these are the all-important pit stops. 
This is a big break for Zanardi. Now there you see he's that body work lying out in the That's middle. That's the tires actually. The that tires, is, yeah. From Someone the, came through and clipped the tires and put them right in the middle of the road. See if we can see what happened here. Last car in line, the white machine of Gualter Salas clips that tire pile at the apex. Ooh. Oh, he clips both apexes big time. Almost looked like Carpentier, who was ahead of him in Tony Bettenhausen's car, might have just tipped the tires, and then, of course, that flipped them up and caught Solace's car. So we now have our fourth yellow of the day, and race leader Paul Tracy is in the pits. Let's get down to Gary Gerald. Everything looks routine for Paul Tracy and the crew. Stop! A lot of activity. Whoa, Parker whoa. Johnstone right in front of him. Oh, Did hit. they make contact? Yes, he hit Parker you Johnstone. There was contact between those two cars. Oh, man, things are just coming unglued here for the Penske team. Let's hope that Paul Tracy does not have damage. Or Parker Johnstone with Team Green. As you see him leave the pits, appears to be okay. Lots of traffic and oh, And he almost has more contact with one of the Pac West cars. That was Mark Blundell moving over into Parker Johnstone's way on the way out of the pit lane. Ay, ay, ay. Now there's Paul Tracy. I believe his right front hit Parker Johnstone's left rear as Johnstone tried to enter the pits in front of him. There's Dario Franchitti in the Hogan Racing team. He had to get around something and obviously put the car in a location in the pits where they couldn't reach him with the fuel hose. That will make for a very long stop. Boy, it is tough when you have all these cars coming in at the same time. There's plenty of room here, but of course, people want to get in as fast as they can. There's a 60 mile per hour limit, but when you're going 60 miles per hour and you wait till the last possible second to break, it still makes things pretty tough. The Hogan team very pleased with their young Scotch Italian driver. There you see him on his way. Here's more from Jack Aroot. Guys, one of the things you're talking about is the fact that all of these teams have a button on their steering wheel which limits the speed that they have. But if you're pitting down towards pit out, what happens is when you drop the jack, you mash the gas to press the button. It doesn't really come into play the 60 mile an hour speed limit, but what it does is it whips the car back and forth. So when you're in tight quarters making your pit stops, that can create a problem. That may be exactly what happened to Paul Tracy. Now let's see where the contact came. There's Paul Tracy. He is under full acceleration, and then you could see his head turn. Paul Tracy was doing what he was supposed to. He had to look at the tires in front of him first to make sure he didn't clip them. Then he actually turned his head to the right, and it was too late. Parker Johnstone was cutting across, but the good thing, it looked like the contact was tire to tire, so it shouldn't cause a problem. Let's get down to Gary Gerald. There's been a hurried conference here in the Penske pits as to whether or not they bring Tracy on to pit road. What they're going to do under this full course yellow is have the wall man on the front straightaway try to take a look and see if there's damage to the suspension on the left front side. Then they'll make a decision. Tracy can't see it himself because of the way the mirror is positioned. Roger Penske and his crew obviously concerned, watching as they await their driver on the front straightaway. One small correction, Gary, it was the right front that made contact with Parker Johnstone's car. That's going to be tough for the guy on the pit wall to see. Well, the other thing is that Paul Tracy did not have a really firm grip on the wheel because when you saw the contact between the two cars, the front wheel actually moved. That's a good thing. It doesn't mean that it necessarily took a big impact. And if that wheel moved in his hands, he may not have bent a tie rod. That, of course, is what steers the car. That's what they're concerned might be bent. Well, Paul Tracy is in the lead. Whether the car is healthy or not, we're not sure. The last time Paul led the race here in Australia was 1995, and he went on to win. We'll be back to Australia. On Thursday afternoon, lots of drivers hit the beach for the annual sand volleyball tournament. This year, the North American drivers took on their colleagues from the rest of the world, much to the delight of the IndyCar fans of Surfers Paradise. A great time for the drivers to have fun and mix with their fans before the pressures of the weekend began. Welcome back to Surfers Paradise Australia, where once again we are under yellow. A succession of yellow flags have slowed this race. While we were away, there was a short stretch of green flag racing, however, before this happened. Parker Johnstone goes up the inside of Blundell, and he also goes up the inside of Brian Herta. He gets in too deep, he locks up the brakes, makes contact with Brian Herta, punctures his radiator, throws water all over the racetrack, and those three cars come to a stop. 
That was an excuse me sort of incident. In fact, Parker Johnstone got out of his car to try and help Brian Hurd to get back underway, but you could not get that car to fire. Now let's get more on Parker Johnstone's situation with Gary Gerald. Bob, here's the end result. He came into the pits after he got the tow for the restart. The crew went to work. They had to change the entire front nose. You can see where through all of the honeycomb and the carbon fiber, it's been destroyed. Side plates, end plates all ripped off. Johnstone bottom line back on track. Meanwhile, one other report on Paul Tracy. Remember, Johnstone was involved in that on pit road. Tracy has reported to his crew the car is actually handling better now than it was earlier. Jack? Well, Gary, remember, Alex Zanardi came into the pits for his first pit stop. We told you he was going to do a wing adjustment. They did that. They took a turn out of the wing. They went from the primary tire to the optional tire. Zanardi so far in that brief green flag period liked the optional tire so much better. The crew took the one final set of primary tires they had, took them back to Firestone, had them remounted with optional tires. Next pit stop, they'll go and change the wing one more time. All right, thank you, gentlemen. Ready to go back to green flag racing here on the streets of Surfers Paradise. The green waves, and Paul Tracy moves away into the lead. And that is amazing that he says his car actually handles better since he made that contact with Parker Johnstone. That is a case where the crew waves the driver out after a pit stop, and it's not really the driver's responsibility to be able to look that far back in the mirror. So thankfully, the Penske miscue is not now causing Paul Tracy any problems, and in fact, actually helped him. Oh, lighten up tires all around. Paul Tracy and Alex Zanardi in second place. Greg Moore runs in third. Jimmy Vassar fourth. Scott Pruitt is fifth. Michael Andretti is now sixth. Mauricio Gugelman is seventh. Andre Ribeiro eighth. Gilles Deferrin ninth. And Raul Bozell in tenth spot. Brian Herta is out of the race. He had moved all the way from 16th to third before he was hit by Parker Johnstone and put on the sidelines. Yes, Brian Herta did not pit when everyone else did because he came in on an earlier yellow. And then something seemed to happen to his car. He was not running with Parker Johnstone at the time. He had slowed down, and Parker then got out of rhythm and made contact with him. The orange and yellow car is Scott Pruitt running in fifth place behind Jimmy Vassar. Pruitt honeymooning here in Australia. He and his wife Jan married in January, but with all the preseason testing and the early season race at Miami, they didn't have time to get away. So they came here to Australia a little bit early and have been enjoying themselves. From here, we will move on to the streets of Long Beach, California, an event you'll see here on ABC Sports next Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. Central and Pacific. And of course, these two tracks are very similar. So what the guys will learn here in Australia, they will take directly with them to Long Beach. Scott Pruitt seems to be closing in on Vassar. That's a look from Jimmy Vassar's car back at Pruitt. Oh, and you can hear Vassar, if you listen to the engine note, you can tell that he's a left foot breaker because he actually was using the brakes and the throttle at the same time briefly as he was going through that chicane. Scott Pruitt is using, is looking very racy. Hard on the brakes and down they come. Gary Gerald has more on Scott Pruitt. The oil alarm, pressure alarm system keeps going off in the cockpit of the 20 car for Scott Pruitt. Talked with Jim McGee, he said, we don't have a problem. Apparently their telemetry is telling them that pressures and temperatures are staying where they want them to in the normal conditions, and all that alarm keeps going off, disconcerting to Pruitt, but apparently not impacting the performance of the car. And Gary, when that alarm goes off, it is very disconcerting because you lose all the rest of the dash. The dash flashes and says, oh, Oil pressure warning, oil pressure warning. And you have to actually reach up on the dash and reset it so you can see all the rest of the gauges. So Scott Pro right now is flipping a lot of gauges as he tries to chase down Jimmy Vassar. Case of deja vu on the streets of Surfer's Paradise. Last year, Jimmy Vassar dominated this race. The only time he did not lead, Scott Pruitt did. Right now, they battle over fourth place. And Scott Pruitt is a huge hero down here. Bob, when you had that paper earlier, that was Scott Pruitt that was on the front and the back page. They just love him down here. And he said the reason he thinks that is, he comes down early and he does all the activities. And he really promotes Australia because he loves coming down here. And of course, the fans have really welcomed that. Flashing along at 175 to 180 miles an hour. Once again, Pruitt's nose right up on the gearbox of Vassar's Reinhardt. Shadows beginning to grow very long here in Australia. Oh, right out by the wall, Pruitt. And 
Michael Andretti watching it all in the black car behind. Michael Andretti is going to try and put some pressure on Pruitt, but I think that Michael Andretti recognizes that Pruitt seems to be faster than Vassar. Right now, he's thinking, okay, if I can put a little bit of pressure on Pruitt, oh, it looked as though Michael did not get well off that corner. Seemed as though the car did not pick up well. That's a 35 mile an hour corner. These cars get all the way down to 5,000 RPM, and some of them don't really come back to life that well. That particular time, the Ford power plant for Michael did not seem to get good drive coming off that corner. There's a huge difference in the rev range here. They go nearly to 15,000 RPM going down the straightaway. And in some of these slow corners, they drop all the way to 5,000. Good example of low revs right there. And there is a very low sun right in the driver's eyes through that complex. Once again, looking back from Vassar's car at Pruitt. Seems as though every time we get some green flag running, this race really gets good. But it seems to break the rhythm every time there's an incident. It seems like the cars are actually closer once everybody gets their rhythm going, their tires warmed up. And it's just going to be a matter of time before Pruitt tries to make a move. Back in 1994, Michael Andretti won this race when it was slowed by rain and became subject to the two-hour time limit in kart racing. That rule remains in effect at the two-hour point after the green flag that started this race for the second time following a red flag the clock continues to tick and when they reach two hours this race will be over now that is not official just yet the race continues under green catching up with the clock if you will that's a decision yet to be made We'll be back with more of Indy Carnival Australia in just a moment. Back at Surfers Paradise, we are under a full course caution once again, and the leaders are pitting. The problem was a fire suffered by Juan Fangio and his Toyota-powered Reynard over on the ocean side of this racetrack. Let's get down to Gary Gerald. Watching the Penske crew work on Paul Tracy. Remember the incident? or did have contact with Johnstone. This time he's away clean. We've got him at under 10 and a half seconds. Terrific stop by the race leader. Plenty of action up and down pit lane. There you see Adrian Fernandez's car being worked on. Dario Franchitti stalls it just outside of his pit position. Phenomenal pit stop. They made a small wing adjustment. No big deal. Now, Vassar just left. So does that mean that Vassar had a problem? Do you want Brian Herta? Vassar came in later. Vassar came in later. And he's got a problem, I think. Is that what the thing? Bob, do you want a Brian Herta interview? I'm five yards behind him. Oh. Gugelman almost ran over Vassar's guys as they scrambled to, to get a spare tire. A loose tire. Straight tire. Bob, you want a uh, herd of interview? Okay. Brian. No. I think Vassar lost quite a few spots. He has shown. Well, he hasn't come across the line yet. Okay. Go see all the cars in front of him. He was running, what, fourth or fifth? Third. He was third? Okay, That's he's, what I came uh, Oh, okay. Brian Herta making a long, frustrating walk back. You had kind of gambled on the, the pit stops, got out of sequence, had moved up to third. Then what happened out there? Well, my tires were going off like a lot of guys, but I had some more laps on them. And so some of the guys behind me were eating me up. We were just trying to bide our time and get to a pit stop. And yeah, I'm not sure who it was, but someone got into me from behind. And you know, it's too bad because the Shell team felt pretty good about our chances today to have a good finish. So it was the tires going away that was costing you those two or three positions right before the contact? Oh, yeah, the tires out there, the tire wear is amazing. Uh, you know, we're really experiencing, uh, you know, a different feel from the cars. The tires change and the fuel goes down. And so, uh, you know, we weren't very fast at that part of the race. We were just, you know, trying to bide our time, get another set of uh, Goodyear's on. Well, better luck next week at Long Beach. Thanks. All right, thanks. 
We are about to go green here at Surfer's Paradise. There you see the safety car, and behind it, the surprise leader, having chosen not to pit, Arndt Meyer, the rookie who won in sports cars at Daytona Beach, Florida earlier this spring, is now the race leader as we go green once again. And watch how fast Paul Tracy gets by him, and we'll see if Alex Sinardi is able to do the same. Oh, he doesn't make it easy. Oh, oh Paul Tracy is going to go off the course. Arn Meyer decided he liked leading, and he made it very, very hard for Paul Tracy. And now Paul Tracy is dispensing of some cones he picked up on the way. Perhaps driving with a little anger at the rookie. Art Meyer in his series debut here at Surfer's Paradise. Here comes Zanardi. Zanardi up the inside, and can Paul Tracy oh! respond? Yes, but they lock wheels. This is incredible. Oh, oh no. I don't know. My, oh, my, oh, my. Zanardi, that was a case of what we used to say when I was a driving instructor of the red mist. That, that is a case where you just get too much adrenaline going, and these guys just start boxing. Now, Zanardi appears to have lost the fire, but the car appears to be in pretty good shape. In the background is Paul Tracy's car. Crews talking with him as well. We were talking about the maturity of Paul Tracy. Frankiti also in trouble. But we were saying before about the maturity of Paul Tracy early in the race to really take his time. But boy, everything came unglued there. And it all started when he had a hard time getting by Art Meyer, who really, I guess he was leading the race. He had the, the ability and the, the effort to do that. But uh, Paul Tracy, boy, those two guys, Zanardi and Tracy, really duped it out. Tracy looking on as Zanardi tries to get back underway. What a sequence of events. Now, Dario Franchitti, you saw, had spun and stalled in the chicane. Zanardi back underway. Meanwhile, there's Parker Johnstone. He has spun off and stopped as the attrition continues. Now, let's go back. Arndt Meyer on the left, Paul Tracy on the right, up onto the curbing, cannot make the chicane. Art Meyer was the leader, and of course, when you're the leader, even though you are a slowing, slower running car, you do not have to let the guys through. He took that as deep as he possibly could. Paul Tracy is thinking right now, oh no, I can't believe he made it that tough. And now he just tries to straight line the chicane, which there's no penalty as long as you don't pick up a position. And Zanardi right now thinks he can pick up the lead, and that's why he gets so aggressive in the next corner. Here he comes, he comes up the inside, really goes for it, but then he swings wide. Paul Tracy does the right thing, gets on the power, and tries to retake the position. But right here, there's contact between the two. And here is where this did not need to happen. There was plenty of racing room between these two cars. Paul Tracy was trying to move Alex Zanardi over. And the other incidents, I think, was just very aggressive racing, but that last one didn't need to happen. Damage to Paul Tracy's right front corner. You see it askew there. That was the end of his race with a bent suspension. And Alex Zanardi avoided going into the tires and got back underway as Paul Tracy cools down in the corner. On board with Zanardi. Tracy to the left. And there's the contact. Whoops, I said he didn't get into the tires. Excuse <laughs> me. Parker Johnstone and Paul Tracy have a moment to talk it over. Neither of these two guys have had a very good day, that's for sure. I would imagine perhaps young Art Meyer's name is coming up in conversation. Yes, but you know, these kind of guys, they have enough experience that even if something doesn't unfold the way you had hoped, you got to be able to regain your composure a couple corners later. I mean, that certainly started it, but that wasn't the reason for this incident. There's Paul Tracy's car being hauled off onto the escape road. He will join his teammate, Al Unser Jr. on the sidelines. There is Paul's girlfriend. Now here's a program note, NASCAR's fastest on the half mile at Bristol. Defending champ Jeff Gordon and the rest will be in Bristol, Tennessee for the Food City 500. Tune in Sunday at 12.30 for NASCAR Today, followed by the race at 1 p.m. Eastern Time on ESPN. Well, 
Walt Tracy can now stand and think about what might have been. Sun beginning to sink low here at Surfers Paradise. The temperature will drop with it. The attrition continues. Now, unofficially, by my count, 17 cars remain of the 28 that began the day. Of course, we lost Christian Fittipaldi's car in an enormous crash when he tangled with Gilles Deferrin on the first attempt to start the race. That brought out a red flag and a full restart. Concern in the Penske pits for Paul Tracy. They are now done. We'll return with more Indy Carnival Australia after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Now let's talk more about Zanardi's pit stop. Here's Jack Aroo. And Bob, when things go bad, they go very bad. Alex Zanardi had to come in, took on just a little bit of fuel, but the primary reason for pitting, his belts had come loose after that altercation. But during the course of the pit stop, the fuel man right here had a small fire. Quick thinking, however, with buckets, simply like this, filled with water, extinguished the fire before anyone was injured. But it was a hairy couple of moments. Back to you. All right, thanks, Jack. Of course, a year ago, Brian Herta's crew was victimized by a pit fire. A lot of attention has been paid to safety here in Australia since then. Now, here is a replay of the reason for Alex Zanardi's pit stop, a tangle with Paul Tracy battling over the, the lead. There you see Zanardi on the left, spinning into the tires, bent front suspension for Tracy, and he's out. Now, Zanardi is obviously going to try and make it as difficult as he can for Tracy by coming to the middle of the road. But for Paul Tracy to come over and try and push him to the right, obviously that's what caused the problem. And Paul Tracy now is out of the race and with a chance, he had a great chance to win the thing. We also saw Dario Franchitti spin and stall in one of the chicanes. Franchitti got going again, made a pit stop. He is back out in the line of cars once again. Green flag is in the flag man's hand. And it waves as Scott Pruitt now takes over the lead here in Surfers Paradise. For Pruitt, the first lead for him since the Michigan 500 in 1996. And Scott Pruitt has looked very fast all day, and he has been very consistent, and he has not tried anything aggressive. Now we'll get to see when he has clear road ahead of him, how fast can Scott Pruitt pedal that thing? And he's got a lot of aggressive drivers behind him. It's wow. Pruitt, Jimmy Vassar in second, Mauricio Gujam in third, Greg Moore fourth, Michael Andretti fifth, followed by Andre Ribeiro, Jill DeFerrin, Richie Hearn, Raul Bozell, and Adrian Fernandez. Scott Pruitt is just absolutely checking out. So the fact that he looked so quick when he was, he was the guy that we used to see in this view behind Vassar. But now that he has a clear road, he has just got that thing lit up. Into the chicanes. Now this is the side of the racetrack where the sun is in the driver's eyes. Oh, Gujelman now being overtaken by Greg Moore. Greg Moore has a good run on him. But you know, Mauricio really recovered well. It looked as though Mauricio lost a lot of speed coming off that prior chicane, but Greg Moore just couldn't quite capitalize on it. Greg Moore is still learning a lot about his car. He is now being followed by Michael Andretti. So you're looking at Greg Moore. That's a 97 Reynard. He only had a 96 Reynard at the first race at Homestead. He's only had 100 miles of testing at Firebird in Arizona and says that every single time he takes the car out, it's a learning experience for them. You can see now as the sun gets lower, it really is being tough for the drivers in that part of the track. Now they turn away from the sun onto the Gold Coast Highway. I mentioned that Dario Franchitti had come in and out of the pits. Apparently he went out just a bit too fast and he will be black flag for a pit lane speed violation. Zanardi presently shown in 17th place. Well, he's picked up three spots on that lap because now he just came across the start finish line in 14. So Alex Zanardi is on the lead lap. So he will be able to, if he can, thread his way through and possibly be another threat for the lead. We know he has the speed. This Michael is the part Andretti's of the racetrack. I'm sorry, Bob, I was going to say, 
That seems to be the place that Michael struggles every time. That is one of the slowest corners on the racetrack, only 35 miles an hour, and he seems to really have a hard time getting off of that corner. He can catch Greg Moore in some of the other places, but it just doesn't seem to come off as well. Again, this is Mercedes versus Ford. Ford, of course, with Michael Andretti, and Mercedes has spent two weeks in Stuttgart. They have a special transient dyno to actually run the engine as though it was being run in a race simulation, and they can try all kinds of adjustments, and they feel as though their car really works well on these low RPM accelerations off the corners. Not only is it Mercedes against Ford, it is the Raynard chassis against the new Swift and Firestone tires against Goodyear's. Well, Michael Andretti with Andre Ribeiro in his mirrors. Now that's another story. We haven't talked at all so far about the Lola. Andre Ribeiro, of course, is driving a Lola chassis, and they have finally got that car to work the way they want to by putting a new bulkhead on the back of the chassis. That's what actually connects the chassis to the engine, and now the car is not flexing and running much quicker. We take a ride now with Andre Ribeiro. Michael Andretti just ahead, and behind this action, Alex Zanardi has gotten around Max Pappas and into 13th place, so he is climbing into the points quickly. And Andre Ribeiro said that when they put the new bulkhead on the engine, when they twisted the car at the Lola factory, they found out that it actually flexed eight times more than last year's car. So it's no wonder people are getting so frustrated with the Lola at the beginning of the season. Now, he says, the back of the car talks to the front, but everything we learned in preseason testing now is no good. They have to start from scratch. Here is Alex Zanardi going by Bobby Rahal's car. That will put Zanardi up into the 12 oh. spot. Oops. Uh-oh. Well, as long, no, that will not cost him a penalty because he had passed Rahal prior to going across the center of the chicane. If you pick up a position by shortcutting the chicane, they will bring you in for a stop and go. But it did certainly appear to me as though he had already completed the pass. But he was going at a speed that caused him to miss the chicane. Yes, but by rules, theoretically, the pass was made. There is Jimmy Vassar, who has an interesting new off-season enterprise. He now owns his own record label, V12 Records. Scott Pruitt up ahead. Jimmy Vassar runs in second place. Mauricio Gugelmin is third. Greg Moore fourth. Michael Andretti fifth. And Andre Ribeiro right there in sixth. Back at Surfers Paradise, Michael Andretti flashes out of your picture. Here is Andre Ribeiro, a two-time winner in PPG Car World Series action. Now, Ribeiro is one of those guys that started on the Firestone Options, which is the harder tire. That is the very same tire that Scott Pruitt started the race on. So that definitely does appear to be the tire of the day. And we know from Jack Aroot that that's also what Alex Zanardi changed over to at his first stop. Oh, that sun just right in the driver's eyes. And that camera view, the, the, the lens cover on that onboard camera is probably not very different from the driver's visor. Well, the only difference being that Andre Ribeiro would have a tinted visor. Now, the glare is still going to be that bad, but of course, he would have effectively like sunglasses there that would help him somewhat. <laughs> Fortunately, that is the slowest complex of corners on the racetrack, about 30 miles an hour. Looks like the Farron behind him is catching him. The Farron, of course, in a Reynard with Honda Power. Both these cars, Honda, that's the battle of the chassis here, as the Farron appears to be possibly closing in on Ribeiro. We haven't talked much about Mauricio Guselman. He, he has actually done a, a fantastic job, and now he starts to close in on the back of Vassar. This year at Pac West, they are building their own shock absorbers for this car. Tim Neff was the engineer on Blundell's car last year. They took him off of Blundell's car, and they actually gave him the opportunity. He came from Penske Shocks to build his entire shock absorbers just for the Pac West team. Guzman has been fourth the last two years here at Surfers Paradise. Gary Gerald has more on him from the pits. 
Jan was mentioning a few moments ago about that new electronic engine calibration for the Mercedes-Benz power plant. And Mauricio Guzman has been one of the most vocal about what it has done to his car. He says that it's really, it drives like an entirely different engine now. He says it's made a huge difference. And I can't help but wondering, is that what's leading him right now to this late attack and a chance to be on the podium? Well, it seems like he's bringing the other Mercedes car of Greg Moore with him as we go back up front and watch the Ford power plant of Scott Pruitt. Now, Ford is the only engine out here that is not a brand new engine for 1997. Everyone else built a brand new engine from the ground up, but Ford is using the same block that they ran last year, and obviously they've made huge improvements. They say right now they're making more power now than they did at the beginning of last year, even when they used to have 45 inches of boost. Now they have 40. The march of technology and the work of the engineers make these cars every bit as powerful and every bit as quick as they've been in the past. And look back from Jimmy Vassar's car. Mauricio Gujeman right there. Greg Moore behind him. Michael oh, there he goes. behind Gujeman. Did he make it? Wow. He, he just took a bonsai move in there, and no, he didn't make it. I, I thought the way he went by, there was no way he was going to be able to get that car stopped, and sure enough, he didn't. Mauricio Guzman, we just said, was doing a great job, but sometimes when you take a risk for a pass, that's how it ends up. Well, there was some confusion there. Our picture's coming from Channel 10 in Australia. Well, Guzman immobile as the field of cars goes by, local yellow only. He's on the escape road. Now, here's another look. Gujamin will dart to the right side of the track as we watch it. Yeah, but you see there's no rubber there. And he just doesn't... Oh, no! He made contact with Vassar. So Vassar's car is damaged in this as well. And now we go to a full course yellow. As Jimmy Vassar touched the wall, we don't know how badly he might be damaged. There's Gujamin. Waiting for the assistance of the safety crews, but once again, we are under a full course caution here at Surfer's Paradise. You ride with Jimmy Vassar. Okay, so he's still running, but he definitely took a hit. Well, that was a case of just a little bit too much rear brake, the track being slippery, and he gets away from, you know, we've seen that three or four times where a guy tries to go to the inside, he gets the rear sideways, and then T-bones the other driver. Obviously, Vassar's coming to the pits to check out for damage. What you're hearing So Jimmy Vassar is about to come in, guys. He's on pit road. Now, here's what they're going to do. They're going to take advantage of this misfortune, add four gallons of fuel, but also change the tires because that's the major concern. The right, the left front corner was wanged a little bit as it came off. You can see the scars on the wheel. He tries to light it up, and there you can hear the misfiring. That's from the button that maintains that 60 mile an hour speed limit. And for the case of Vassar, he only needs to do it for 10 yards. Good strategic placement of the pit. 50 laps now complete. But he's going to lose a lot of track position in this. So, you know, he had to come in because of the contact in case he had a cut tire. But uh, that's going to be a really tough break for Vassar. Ride with Bobby Rahal in 11th spot. Just ahead is Alex Zanardi who's now up to 10th place as his teammate drops back behind him after that incident with Mauricio Gujelman. Gujelman, he is on the sidelines too. We'll be back. Back on the streets of Surfers Paradise Australia, the Kart Indy Carnival Australia continues into the glare of the late afternoon sun goes race leader Scott Pruitt with Greg Moore, Michael Andretti, Andre Ribeiro, Gilles DeFerrin, and Richie Hearn behind him as we prepare to go green one more time. Now the race has been declared officially a timed race. 50 laps are complete of the 65 originally scheduled, but we will have 10 minutes to go in the race. We will be with you until the checkered flag, the green flag waves, we're back underway. And I'm not sure what was going on with Greg Moore, but Greg Moore just gave away a huge advantage to Scott Pruitt on that restart. I'm not sure what Scott Pruitt did, but he definitely caught Greg Moore sleeping. 
Greg Moore has Michael Andretti in that black car all over him. Then Andre Ribeiro runs behind. Keep in mind, Michael Andretti came from 14th to win in the season opener in Miami. He started 12th, and now he runs third here in Surfers. Another guy who's making a move is Gilles DeFerrin. Of course, he had that huge crash at the beginning of the race, got into his spare car, but he has just kind of quietly been moving himself up now to fifth spot. Gary Gerald has more on Scott Pruitt. Well, a tremendous sigh of relief here in the Pat Patrick racing camp when they got the official word, officials going up and down the line, letting everybody know that it is a timed race. Their only concern was if it wasn't a timed race, they were really iffy on how much fuel could they go to the end. Now they don't have to worry about that. And Scott's new bride, Judy, who's been here on a hectic honeymoon, they were here several days before this event, could be riding her way to a storybook honeymoon finish as she just says, I can't stay. And it. They're going to have to a few more minutes. There is Michael Andretti in the Swift. And there is that sunlight. Even with, you see the white visor strip at the top of the visor on Michael Andretti's helmet. Even with that, that sun has to be just piercing inside those helmets. Yeah, the biggest problem is that you lose sight of the car ahead of you. You can still have the walls on both sides, but if someone ahead of you slowed, you'd never see him and you'd smack right in the back of him. Breaking it down, shifting for the first chicane. Fairly evenly spaced between these guys. Good mix of chassis and engines. Ford leading, Mercedes second, Ford in third, and then a Honda behind. So the Honda dominance uh, that we had last year certainly looks as though it's in jeopardy of going away again at this race. Well, at the beginning of the race, we talked about how avoiding trouble might be key to winning the race, and we have certainly seen plenty of trouble today here in Surfer's Paradise. Officially 17 cars still running. Mauricio Gugelman got refired, came in and pitted for a check over and is back out there. Now Greg Moore, who's running in second place as we look at Raul Boisel, who of course is the teammate to our leader, Scott Pruitt. Moore said that he loves this racetrack because it was the place he got his first podium. There's a lot of drivers that there's a lot of sentimental value here at Surfers and of course Scott Pruitt would be one of those. Raul Boisel from Brazil with his fourth team in as many years, looking for his first top five finish since the final race of the 1994 season. He's been plagued by a lot of bad racing luck. Here comes an on-fire Zanardi. Zanardi knows he doesn't have much time left. He has one of the fastest cars here, probably other than Pruitt. So he's got to try and pick his spot and pick up some of those spots. What you're thinking right now is, Bob, you're trying to think, okay, I've got to get the power down well. I've got to get off this corner because the best place to pass, obviously, is in the braking zones for the chicanes. But it did appear as though Raul actually got a little better drive coming off that corner. Zanardi runs in seventh. He'd like to score as many points as possible before they load up the cars at the end of the day and fly them back to California for next week's Grand Prix of Long Beach, which will be coming your way at 4 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Central and Pacific here on ABC. Be sure to be with us for that. Sonardi closes in on the brakes. You can see he went a little bit wider, trying to get a better shot. Now, this will be important. How can he get on to the back straightaway? Uh, you know, he carried some brake in there and seemed to, again, to lose a little bit of speed coming onto the back straightaway. You know, these Fords, people in years past have said the Ford hasn't had a whole lot of power. But I'll tell you what, that Ford is having no trouble at all with this Honda. Right now, they're using all the revs, they're using all the fuel. We heard from the pits that everyone has been notified it's a timed race, so they will put everything to full qualifying mode, and they're just going for it. Nearly 15,000 RPM, they twist these things, and you can hear it. Now, unofficially, just a little over four minutes remaining. It'll only be about a couple of laps before we'll see the white flag and then the checkers. So if you're going to make a move, it's going to have to come soon. Before we move on to the Toyota Grand Prix of Long Beach, the championship points begin to accumulate rapidly. Sonardi had a little bit of push in the final corner, meaning that the car did not turn as well as he had hoped. 
and that's what's making it tough for him. He's not getting into the corners as well as we go back up front, and Scott Pruitt looks like he has clear sailing. And we're hearing that the next time by, we will get the white flag. Scott Pruitt will take the white flag, leading Greg Moore by two seconds. That comes from race control, so we expect the white flag next time by for that man, Scott Pruitt. And as you can see, he has a healthy gap over Greg Moore. And we've talked about staying out of trouble. If you look and think back about this entire race, the guys that really did a good job about staying out of trouble are now running 1-2. Greg Moore with a healthy gap over Michael Andretti in third place at this point. This has got to give a lot of confidence to Greg Moore. It's the first time he's ever run that car, done very little testing like we said before, and that really makes the guy feel good when you take it out first time and you get it up on the podium. Has that dark tinted visor that we spoke about earlier, many of the drivers using. The white flag is up. And Scott Pruitt will take it one more time around this 2.7 mile circuit in Surfers Paradise for Scott Pruitt, hoping to pick up his first victory since the Marlboro 500 in 1995, when he beat Al Unser Jr. by the narrowest of margins in a great passing duel on the last lap. And right now, Greg Moore looks like he may be able to close up just a little bit on Pruitt. And the folks who printed that front page with Scott Pruitt's likeness all over it in the morning newspaper here at Surface Paradise are going to look like geniuses. And you know, like we said before, they love Scott Pruitt down here because he's always promoted Australia. He comes down early. He enjoys all the activities. And I'll tell you what, the crowd gets into this race, and they're going to love the fact that Scott Pruitt, of course, he's still got a half a lap to go. Anything can happen. But if he brings it home, he'll be a big-time favorite. He is on his honeymoon with his wife. He walked the high wire in qualifying, wound up losing an engine to an electrical gremlin, had to jump into the hastily reconfigured car, the backup car, set up for his teammate, Raul Bozell. He went out there with a less than perfect car, but radioed to his crew, I can do this, I can qualify this car, we will be in good shape. Got it in the field, was fastest in the morning warm-up, and after a day littered with collisions, yellow flags and what have you, Scott Pruitt, may just come through to pick up his first victory in almost two years. And, and his best finish last year was a second place. So one step better for Scott Pruitt. Now here's something curious. They're going to wave the white flag again this time by for Scott Pruitt. Okay. <laughs> well, now Greg Moore is close enough. You see, what you do is you slow down so that you win by the smallest margin possible. You could see the crew, obviously, there cannot believe what's happening. Let's hear more from Gary Chow. Well, Jim McGee and this crew absolutely stunned and in disbelief. They were ready to jump up off of a wall, accepting the checkered. Suddenly, they hollered, what? And he looked at his watch and then immediately was on the radio telling Scott, white flag again, white flag again, to make sure that he didn't back out of the throttle. And now we have a race on our hands, Gary, because as you know, what you want to do, like I was saying before, you, you don't need to win the race by much. You tend to kind of back off on the last lap. Now, Craig Moore thinks, hey, I'm close enough. I could win this thing, and we've got a race. What else could happen in today's race? Greg Moore just a few car lengths back now as they flash down the Oceanside Road, the Esplanade through the chicane one more time, and now the young Canadian will surely have the bit between his teeth. He knows he is that close, and he's just been handed one more lap in which to try to make the pass on Pruitt. And as you saw him get squirming yeah. around under acceleration, Greg Moore is definitely trying. He is, he's nearly close enough, but he's only got a couple of corners where he can get it done. Oh, and Scott Bruin is pushing. He locks the brakes. He swings wide, but it's not enough for Greg Moore. Well, it appears that Bruin is in good shape now, and we have two flags, both of them checkered from the flag stand as Scott Bruin flashes underneath to take what surely must rank as one of the most unusual race victories of his career. We'll be back to talk with our winner in just a moment. Stand by for more from Australia. ABC Sports coverage of the Indy Carnival Australia.
Brought to you by Firestone, America's tire since 1900. American Honda, maker of fine quality automobiles, motorcycles, and power equipment. Split Fire, the patented performance V spark plug. And Haviland Formula 3 motor oil. Add more life to your car. Tomorrow night, ABC begins with a brand new episode of Relativity. Then baseball season's open and your favorite team is back in action. Charlie Sheen, Tom Berenger, Corbin Burnson, and Rene Russo star in the network premiere of Major League Two tomorrow night on ABC. Here's Jack Aru. Well, we're here in Victory Lane with Scott Pruitt, a third two years ago, a second last year on your honeymoon of victory. Congratulations from Pat Patrick. Oh, well, it's been a heck of a job. You know, the Brahma guys, you know, we went through a lot this weekend. Had a big, big problem the first day, tremendous problem the second day. Had to go to Raul's backup car. But the guys did a super job. The Firestones worked great all day long. Um, I just got to say thanks again to Brahma, Firestone, Pennzoil. You know, we went through a lot this weekend, and to come out on top is just ah, tremendous. Big gamble by your crew, too, because you pitted early, figuring that maybe this thing wasn't going to go the distance as advertised. Well, we didn't know. And, uh, well, you know, Pat, he's a gambling man and uh, he's the one who makes the calls and uh, it played out for us today terrific again uh, thanks to the crowd Australia here it's horrendous Congratulations to Scott Pruitt with a great victory. The second of his career. Here's a look at the final results. And we'd like also to apologize to Scott's new wife, Judy, for misnaming her earlier in the program. My fault completely. Judy, you can be proud of your man. 57 laps complete rather than the 65 schedule due to the two-hour time limitation. Final margin of victory, 0.684 seconds. Scott Pruitt over Greg Moore with Michael Andretti third. Now let's get down to Gary Gerald. Alex Zanardi, did the double white flag help you to finally end up fourth place in that long drive back? Well, definitely helped me when I had the accident with Paul uh, to, to, to get back to the back of the group, but I was that last, so I had to work my way up to fourth. What happened in that incident as you battled with Paul Tracy? Do you think that could have been avoided at all? Everything can be avoided in life, uh, but unfortunately we were both racing hard and we both uh, always want uh, very badly to be in front of everybody and uh, at that point I gained the lead, uh, it was coming back on me and uh, I don't know what happened uh, because it happened behind me and uh, I, I can't comment that. Thank you. Thank you. A philosophical Alex Zanardi with his win in the season opener and a third place today, Michael Andretti remains atop the championship points. Now let's get back down to Jack Aroot. Well, Greg Moore, a podium finish. You like Australia, don't you? Yeah, Australia's been real good to me, and I just, uh, I mean, I'm just delighted. We got, it's a brand new car we brought here to the, for the weekend, and, you know, we got 500 miles on it now. I just can't be so happy. When you have a finish like this and you start looking at another road course just a week from now in Long Beach, what does it do psychologically for a driver? It, it makes us uh, it makes us really excited for, you know, next weekend. I mean, Long Beach has always been good to me in lights and IndyCar, and, you know, hopefully we'll uh, do a little bit better than we did last year. Good luck there. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Coming up next, the tradition presented by Countrywide. So long, everyone.